Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at DSA taking a look at some of the really cool guns in their reference collection to show to you guys. And today we have a Vector SS-77. This is a South African general purpose machine gun that was adopted in 1987 and then sort of adopted again in 1993. We'll get to that in a minute. But the backstory to this is essentially that in the 1970s South Africa needed a new domestically manufactured machine gun. So the issue was they had a bunch of legacy systems that they were using. They had air-cooled Brownings, mostly 1919A4s. They had water-cooled Vickers guns still that they'd converted to 7.62 NATO. They had leftover World War II Bren guns that they'd converted to 7.62 NATO. And they did also have FN mags. And the FN mag is an outstanding general purpose machine gun. However, the FN mags were starting to get a bit old. They were in need of repair and new parts and servicing. And South Africa at this point was under international embargo, and so the South Africans weren't able to work with FN. So they have these FN mags, but they recognize that the guns are going to kind of fall out of service as parts wear out for them. And so they needed to develop something domestically. And so in 1977 a design is begun by two guys uh, named Boer Smith and Laszlo Seregi. And by the way, Smith and Seregi are the SS in SS-77, along with the date of the concept, essentially. So they finish off their, their concept, their initial design in 1978, and they turn it over to LEW, Littleton Engineering Works in South Africa. Uh, LEW makes a couple of prototypes, and they start the testing process with the South African Defense Forces. Now the testing and development would take a number of years. They went through some significant trials in the early 1980s, but found a bunch of problems, went back fixed the problems, did some more testing, kind of a back and forth process, uh, culminating with a 70,000 round endurance trial, and ultimately South African military adoption in 1987. The guns go into production, and before we talk about what happened, because they had a little bit of a rough adoption process after this point, the gun itself mechanically is a fantastically cool design. Uh, Smith and Seregi looked at all of the other machine gun designs that were out there, and they picked a really good selection of best features off a variety of different guns. So the most unusual thing that they chose was to copy the action from the Soviet uh, Goryanov, the SG-43, which has a not quite unique but very unusual side tilting bolt that allowed them to have a very short receiver travel. Um, they took essentially recoil spring system from the AR-18. Uh, they took a gas regulator from the PK, well, from the PKM, although they ended up getting rid of that, which again we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and then they took a number of elements from the FN mag. The top cover is essentially just a copy of the FN mag, as is the barrel change mechanism. Put that together with some polymer furniture, a good side folding stock, essentially an, a strengthened version of the bipod from the South African Galil rifles, and presto, you have your domestic manufacturer new GPMG. Let's take a closer look at how all of those different design elements work together. All right, a couple basic vital statistics before we begin. This is full auto only. There is no semi-auto selector for it. Uh, gun weight overall is just over 10 kilos. It's about 22.3 pounds. So this is a this is a full size real steel, you might say, uh, GPMG. Um, really kind of on par with the FN mag. A little bit lighter than the mag, but not. You know, not hugely so. Uh, rate of fire is between 700 and 900 rounds per minute. You actually have a bunch of options for feeding, which makes sense because the South Africans had a bunch of systems in place. Uh, so you can run this on M13 links, you can run it on German DM1 belts, or you can actually run it on the South African converted uh, Vickers 7.62 links. So that's pretty cool. Um, you can have a belt hanging out the side of the gun. Or they made this 100 round, what was called a pear sack. I'm sure it never had any other sort of more colorful name in the field, but unzip the bottom, you can put a 100 round belt in that, and then this thing locks in place on this little peg on the side of the receiver. So I can slide that in there, close that down on top of it, close the top cover down, and there you go, you've got a hundred round feed straight out of the bag into the gun under that dust cover. 
Now, originally, the South Africans planned to replace all of the Brownings that they had in service as vehicle guns with SS-77s, and so the design included uh, trunnion mounting points to match the Browning setup. Uh, they didn't end up actually doing that, by the way. They kept a lot of the Brownings in service, realizing they were, in fact, really good guns, and the extra weight um, of a, a belt-fed Browning is really not that big a deal on a vehicle. But to go along with those, they did actually also develop a spade grip uh, attachment for the SS-77, and designed the pistol grip such that, or the firing mechanism, such that a spade grip could just bolt on. So if we go to the back of the gun here, this button allows me to just slide the buttstock off. The springs are contained within the receiver, so then I can just slide the spade grip assembly up. This acts as our safety, lift that up, and when I push that thumb trigger in, it's going to push this plunger, which is going to go through this tube and essentially duplicate the function of the trigger. So in order to install it, I actually have to lift that safety up, which allows this to retract just enough that it can slide on there. And then when I put it back in position, that plunger goes right into the back of the trigger assembly. And presto, you have an SS-77 ready for vehicular mount with spade grips. All right, before we go further into disassembly, there are a couple other features that I want to show you. One of them is the bipod. This is a Galil-style bipod. It locks into the Galil-style handguard there. Lift it up. Those, the legs come apart. And you have a bipod that gives you a little bit of rotation. Uh, no, no flex forward and back. It's simplistic, but effective. These, the legs are a little bit heavier, stronger than the bipod on the Galil, and the feet pads are significantly larger to help it uh, keep above ground. The muzzle device here is essentially copied from the R1 FAL. You've got four sets of uh, vent holes on the compensator there. You've got a front post with a flip-up night sight. Take that down and you've got a, a round front sight post. The whole thing can be adjusted uh, left to right to set your windage. Originally these had PKM style three position gas regulators. This particular one does not, and I'll touch on that later in the video. And if I don't want it anymore, I can remove the bipod by pressing in on that lever and just popping the bipod off the front of the gun. There's no semi-auto position, it's just a full auto trigger with a safety right there that locks the trigger. The rear sight is very much FN mag-like. You can see we have a rear aperture sight there, adjustable up to 800 meters. There are dust covers on everything, so there's a dust cover on the link ejection port. There is a dust cover on the shell casing ejection port. And there is a dust cover on the belt feed opening. So uh, the South Africans had experience in lots of very sandy, windy, dusty environments, and they recognized the benefits of dust covers. Barrel removal is essentially just copied from the FN mag, so I'm just going to push in this lock button rotate the handle upward, and the barrel slides right out. Unlike the MAG and the PK and most of the other GPMGs out there, the gas piston is not directly connected to the bolt carrier. So I have this little spring catch there. If I push that in, I can just remove the gas piston. Now the fun part is the back end. So top cover pops up. By the way, you can see on the feed tray here we have a couple stop positions milled in. These are there to help prevent the belt from uh, sliding backwards, and they're set for the different pitch rates, the different pitch lengths um, of the different belts that the gun can be used with. So the pitch is the distance between cartridges in the belt. And so this could be used with a wide variety, um, some that are very tight and some that are very loose. Anyway, um, spring-loaded feed tray there, and you can see we now have, well, I'll tell you what, let me take off the top cover. We have one pin right there that holds the top cover in place, so take that pin off. There we go, there is our top cover and feed tray assembly, all hooked together straight off an FN mag, which is in turn basically a copy of the German MG42. And 
I can also take off the firing group. We have, again, one pin right there. Pull that pin out, and voila, the firing grip. The grip assembly and fire control parts come off. So just a very simple pull trigger drop sear. And as you saw earlier, you can also push in on this plunger and that will drop the sear. Um, our safety there also lifts up a pair of lug or a lug here in the front so that if the bolt is forward, engaging the safety prevents the bolt from being cycled. All right, now we have the actual action. And you can see this is slightly asymmetric. There's a lot more material over here, including this separate component right there. That is the locking shoulder because when the bolt locks right there, it actually pivots into the left side of the receiver. So this is unlocked, traveling, and cams into the side of the receiver and locks in place. This is a system that was taken, uh, copied from the Soviet Goryanov light machine guns, or Goryanov general purpose machine guns of World War II. The spring system, spring retention, is also really cool. So this is the back of the recoil spring guide, and this plate actually locks onto the two recoil springs and holds them in the gun. So if I'm going to hold that spring in, I'm going to take this plate and just lift it up like that, and you can see these round cutouts at the bottom, and now I can pull the springs very AR-18-like, pair of guide rods, pair of springs, and they just come out the back of the gun. This plate is captive right there. You can see it's, there's a pin through the receiver up here and a slot that it rides in. So you can lift it up, but you can't lose it. And as long as the plate is down, the bolt won't come far enough back to come out of the gun. But if I lift this plate up and out, now the bolt comes back just a little bit further and I can there we go. I can lift it out just like that. So I can lift the bolt off the bolt carrier. You can see we have this sort of ovoid cam and that is what is going to push the bolt out to one side when it comes back. So unlocked locked. We have a firing pin inside the bolt body itself, and it's held in place by that pin. So it's got a return spring on it, but essentially what's going to happen is as soon as the bolt closes, the back of the firing pin slams against this cam lug, and you can see the little circle there where it's worn, and, uh, and that fires the gun. So it, it fires from an open bolt. As soon as the bolt fully closes and locks, right there, you can see how it's spring-loaded, that is the gun firing. So as soon as the bolt carrier starts to move backwards, there's nothing in contact with the firing pin spring and that, or in the, with the firing pin, and that keeps it safe, keeps it from firing out of battery. Notice we have these diagonal slots here. That's, uh, those are essentially sand cuts. You'll see them on uh, foul receivers. They basically just give uh, a space for dirt and debris and fouling to accumulate without actually putting a lot more friction into the system. So that's clever. Here's our roller cam pin to interact with the feed system. Notice that it is spring-loaded, so you can uh, close the top cover whether the bolt is forward or rear. And then lastly, we have a buffer spring in the back here, and I, I'm definitely not going to take that apart. Um, that is a tight enough buffer spring that I can't even move it by uh, just with my thumb. But that absorbs the last residual energy when the bolt uh, cycles all the way back. This has a really remarkably short receiver length. Um, it's really cool to have a short receiver with the, the springs all self-contained. You can get a folding stock. Uh, it's, it's a very, very clever, cool design. And there you go. There is one Vector SS-77, all the way field stripped. Now I mentioned that the guns were adopted in 1987, and that's true. They went into production, they started getting into military service, and they fairly quickly started recognizing problems. And by 1991, there were so many problems with the gun that it was actually pulled out of service. And from 91 to 93, 
uh, Vector would essentially redesign a few parts and refit all of the guns that had been produced. And the biggest bugbear for these guys with the SS-77 was the gas piston. They just seemed to have endless rounds of problems with the gas piston. So eventually they would develop a strengthened, upgraded gas piston that went into the guns. By 1993, most of the problems seemed to have worked out. Um, other problems they had included the springs in some of the, the cover, like uh, dust cover plates, pins coming loose, extractors breaking, and of course the big one was the gas pistons breaking. So by 93 they've got all the problems sorted out, uh, the gun is readopted back into service, and in 1994 the second production run begins, and this gun is off of that second production run. So at that point they made a number of simplifications based on field experience essentially. One was with the gas regulators, they realized the difference in, in functionality, the difference in rate of fire with the different gas selector settings was really kind of negligible, wasn't really important, and so they just deleted it. Like we can, we can get rid of a bunch of parts and a bunch of manufacturing costs, simplify the gun by just boop, deleting the gas regulator. So the second production guns, like this one, just have a single preset gas system setting. Um, the early guns had a fluted barrel, they got rid of that. They just went to a, a smaller profile, smooth barrel, faster to make, about the same weight overall. Again, just simpler. And lastly, they slightly simplified the muzzle device by omitting the internal threading for blank firing adapters. Apparently they realized they just didn't ever do any blank fire training with these guns, so why bother including that? So those went away. Um, about this same time, uh, in 1992, production of the Mini SS machine gun begins. That was a version of this gun scaled down to 5.56, and I actually have a previous video on that design, so I'll link to that uh, here at the end of this one in case you're interested in checking out the, uh, the Mini Me version of Smith & Seregi's machine gun. So a big thanks to DSA for giving me access to this one to take a look at. There are very few of these in the US, and they aren't really around that many other places in the world, because of course South Africa was under military, well under economic embargo, uh, while these guns were being manufactured, so they never really saw that much of an export market, which is, for the gun, unfortunate, because this is a very, very mechanically cool gun. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video, thanks for watching.